Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. My Friend Jeremy by Randy Hogan It was summer 2000 when my family decided to buy a house in a beautiful neighborhood in North Carolina. We were originally from California, but my dad had just been recently relocated by his job to help oversee a new office opening up on the East Coast. The difference between life in California and life in North Carolina was night and day because the people in Carolina seemed to live life at a slower pace and enjoy everything around them, including the company and friendship of their neighbors, whereas the people in California lived such a faster-paced lifestyle they never seemed to acknowledge other people unless invoked. I had to get used to everybody saying hi and introducing themselves, and the fact that I was going through my awkward teen years did not help the uncomfortable feeling of meeting new people. Even though I had trouble being social, I would be lying if I said that I wasn't excited to make new friends. However, I was bummed to hear that most of the kids my age had gone off to summer camp right before we had moved in. And then I met Jeremy. I'd been exploring my neighborhood when a strange boy my age came and introduced himself. The reason I say that Jeremy was strange was due to how he was dressed in a very faded outfit that looked like it was from the 50s, and Jeremy had a very pale complexion and dark rings around his eyes. But nonetheless, I was relieved to meet someone my age. I asked Jeremy how long he'd lived in the area, and he said since he could remember. I also asked where he lived, and he pointed to a more worn-down house than all the other houses. I just took this as his family was possibly poor, but that did not matter to me. I was happy to just meet someone my age. He took me around town and introduced me to some popular local spots. However, I noticed that everyone would look strangely at us whenever we were talking. When I'd mentioned it to Jeremy, he would just shrug it off as me being paranoid about being new. As the first few weeks went by, I only saw Jeremy every two or three days, and every time I saw him, He'd be standing near the park, looking over at an exposed drain pipe that led to the local river, and when I'd ask him what he was doing, he would just completely ignore the question. And the even stranger part was he always had the same outfit. Again, I just brushed it off as having a friend was nice and I didn't want to offend him by being rude. But things suddenly began to become strange when Jeremy wanted to play more dangerous games like cliff jumping into the river, which had to be a good 20-story drop, and I would continually decline seeing the danger of doing so, but Jeremy would get a sick look in his eyes that grew more disturbing every time he brought up the subject. One afternoon, I was walking back from the store, getting some things for my parents, when I saw Jeremy by the drain pipe, and I have to be honest, I did try to hide from him due to his increasingly odd behavior but he noticed me and came up to me. The moment he reached me, my stomach was in knots. I mean, I might have actually been a tiny bit scared of him because I didn't know what he would do this time around, and my insight of worry was redeemed 
as the moment Jeremy walked up to me, he went into a yelling tirade about how I was a bad person for not being there for him and how I was like all the other kids in town, there just to ridicule and humiliate him. I became very nervous as I could tell there was no reasoning with him, and for a minute I thought he'd throw me to the ground and start punching my face and my parents would later find me laid out on the pavement in a mess of groceries and blood. I was lucky enough that Jeremy became distracted again by the notion of jumping off the drain pipe, and before I knew it, my heart sank to my stomach and my face turned pale white as in the blink of an eye, Jeremy jumped off the drain pipe and into the rapid currents that feed out to the river a mile downstream. I ran to see if I could see him resurface, but nothing so I dropped the bag of groceries and ran to Jeremy's house to alert his parents what happened. But when I got there, the house was decrepit and rotting with no sign that anybody has lived there for years. Freaked out, I then ran to my parents who happened to be talking to one of the neighbors and when I told them what happened, the neighbor's face turned as pale as mine. The neighbor explained that Jeremy had died back in 1955 when he jumped off the same drain pipe and drowned. They explained that Jeremy was bipolar, and in those days there wasn't enough medical attention for people with that condition, and the fact that Jeremy's family was ashamed by him and the other kids teased him ruthlessly did not help out matters any. And the only reason Jeremy jumped in the first place was to gain acceptance, but it only led to his demise. Jeremy's mom and dad tried to sell their home after what happened, but potential buyers kept saying they felt an angry presence in the house, so they sold it to the bank, and it sat empty for years, with people sometimes reporting seeing a young man walking in and around the house. To say I was speechless is an understatement. I mean, the one potential friend I make is a ghost? But my nightmare had not yet ended. As a few weeks later, once school had started, I made some actual friends, and they invited me to hang out by the river after school to fish. I accepted, and later that day we went down to the river to fish, and everything was going great. We started playing a game to see who could throw a rock further, and the main goal was to try to make it to the other side's shore, which was about 150 yards apart. And as I got up from my turn, I dropped the rock out of my hand in pure terror, as on the other side waving to me with that same sick look in his eyes, accompanied by a disturbing grin. I turned and dropped the rock out of my hand in pure terror as on the other side, waving to me with that same sick look in his eyes, was Jeremy, accompanied by a disturbing grin. I turned and ran all the way home and have never gone near the drain pipe or the river since and I haven't seen Jeremy. The Day Ma Died by Luther Cross I'll never forget the day my Ma died. She held on longer than any of us expected she woulda, but eventually death comes for us all. You don't care how or where or when. When it's time to go, well, it's time to go. It's not that I was shocked when Dr. Peterson called to tell me that she'd taken a turn for the worse. I was in denial. We all were. But I knew. The second I recognized his voice, I knew why he'd called. I knew that Ma wasn't long for this world, and like a good and dutiful son, I packed myself up in my car and drove for the city, for the hospital where she'd spend her final moments. Everybody was there when I showed up, my brothers, my sister, my aunts, uncles, and cousins. It pained me that Pa couldn't be there with us, and my heart sank when I realized that it would be my responsibility to tell him that Ma had passed on. I dreaded that conversation more than the moment my ma would draw her final breath. I held her hand till the very end. From the moment I crossed the threshold of her room 
till her dying breath left her lips. Such a strange thing to be holding on to someone like that when their soul leaves their body. I could feel her go. There was a change in the air, a drop in pressure or something like that, and then she was just gone. The room erupted in howling cries of pain and grief. Aunt Geraldine ripped open the door and screeched into the hallway. Nurses came running, shoving us all out of the way. I simply smiled, patted Ma's hand, and stood up to move out of their way. A few tears ran down my cheeks as I watched the nurses confirm what I already knew. Ma had finally passed on. She'd suffer no more, and for that, I was grateful. The drive home was spent in pure silence. I turned the radio off and left myself alone with my thoughts. I was sickened by the fact that a part of me was glad to see Ma go. I mean, no one should have to suffer the way she did, and that part of her journey was finally over. But then my thoughts would turn back to Pa, and my gut would twist itself up into knots. I had no idea what kind of commotion he might cause when I broke the news to him. Lately, he'd been a right thorn in my backside. I just hoped he wouldn't send me to be with Ma prematurely. When I got home that night, Pa was already agitated. I think he knew about Ma, somehow, before I ever uttered a word. He was standing in the darkest corner of the living room, his back facing me. He rocked gently, swaying on his feet. He did that sometimes. Scared the crap out of me when I woke up to find him standing in the darkened corners of my bedroom that way. But I could never be mad at him. He was my paw, my blood. Pa, I called out, closing the front door behind me. Pa, we need to talk. He stopped rocking and stood completely still, his eyes boring holes into that dark corner. I flopped down on the couch and took a deep breath, rubbing my eyes with the palms of my hands. It's about Ma, I said, and before I could even move my hands away from my eyes, Pa was standing over me, boring into me with his cold gray eyes. After a few moments, I realized that intense stare was his way of telling me to continue, so I did. It's about Ma, I stammered, unsure how to say the words. She… I sighed deeply and tears broke free from my eyes. She's dead, Pa. Ma's dead. My body racked with sobs and I broke down into a blubbering mess right there on the couch. When I finally found myself again, I looked up to see Pa, sitting in the chair across the way with his head in his hands. I could clearly see that he was sobbing, but there was no sound. My heart broke all over again, watching him suffer in silent torment, but I knew what I had to do. It was time. Pa, I said, reaching a shaking hand towards him, there's something else you need to know. He looked up at me then, his eyes red-rimmed and full of those awful, silent tears. You're dead too, Pa. It's time for you to go now. The Basement Door by Janine Franks I grew up in a sleepy country town in my grandparents' old colonial farmhouse, which my mother inherited. I was raised to be respectful and mind my manners, but when I was outside playing with my friends, I was a rambunctious eight-year-old girl. I loved to explore the farm and pretend I was a detective, but my parents said the basement was off-limits. 
When I was a teenager, my mother told me the only time I was allowed in the basement was to do the laundry, as she was older and had difficulty going up and down the stairs. I noticed in the back of the basement there was a door that was nailed shut. I asked my mother about it and she said, stay clear of that door, do you understand? Well, after that day, I was banned from the basement and the laundry was done at a family friend's house. As the years passed, both my parents' health declined and they passed away two weeks apart. After the funeral services, I was approached by a tall, lanky man who handed me an envelope and said, your parents told me to give this to you upon their deaths. Still in shock from losing both parents, I forgot about the envelope given to me. Wiping the tears from my eyes, I opened the envelope and to my surprise, it was the deed to the old farmhouse. Now that the house was mine, I could do and go where I wanted, and the first thing I did was remove the nailed boards from the basement door. I opened the door in haste as I was anxious to see why the boards were placed there in the first place. At first, it seemed like a normal, musty room, but as I stepped into the room, I saw a swirling, glowing orb of light against the wall. I was hesitant to touch the orb, but I overcame my fear. As I touched the orb, I fell through to the other side. I couldn't believe my eyes. The landscape was all wrong. There were no houses or roads. I walked what seemed like hours, and I finally saw the inhabitants of this land. They were Neanderthals. I hid behind some bushes as to not draw attention to myself and saw all types of dinosaurs, saber-toothed tigers, and other species that were supposed to be extinct. My heart was racing, and I made up my mind to head back to try and locate the entrance from which I entered. I walked and walked, and finally I found the entrance. I stepped into the glowing light, and I was back in my basement. I boarded up that door and never told anyone my experience. I'm 78 years old now, never married or had children in fear they'd discover what was on the other side of the door, and left strict instructions in my last will to demolish the house upon my death. Now I know why my parents banned me from going anywhere near that door. I regret I opened it to this day. More horror fiction on this Thriller Thursday edition of Weird Darkness, coming up. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. The Bog Body Boogeyman by H. J. Taylor The night was hot, air thick and soupy. The subtle change in the temperature from day to night wasn't enough for a man to notice. A soft breeze was welcoming, but not nearly sufficient. The rifle in his hand was slippery from the sweat. 
He wiped his hands one at a time, holding firmly on his rifle with the other, something which he had done so much the whole front of his pants were now wet and muddy. He moved slowly, ears fine-tuned to the various sounds of the night. Crickets, small rodents, and the high cornstalks rubbing against one another. He moved with purpose, every footfall where it should be, a soft and delicate crunch of dirt. His leather vest and khakis making a soft sigh as the cornstalks brushed against him. The moonlight was bright but scattered. Luna passing in and out from behind the clouds like a child behind Mama's dress, the dark rain clouds turning twilight to complete blackness. He pushed his Stetson back to better see above the rolls. His target was said to be massive. He sensed a clearing coming up. The change in sounds told him so. The rustling of the stalks sounded different, fine-tuned. He stood scanning the field from behind a roll just out of sight. He seen nothing but a field and a small barn in the distance and more corn beyond it. He slipped out of the stalks as silent as a ghost and as fearsome as Satan himself, rifle up, eyes leading down the sights, a full clip and one ready to kill. Fine-tuned. He seen movement between the boards, something moving like a shadow. The black was blacker. His instincts took over immediately and he hunkered down low, not unlike that of a jaguar. He slithered as if he was a serpent, slowly but with purpose, until he was afoot from the old shabby boards of the barn. He seen nothing now and heard less. It knew he was there. As he stood looking in through the cracks, he was almost positive he could smell him. The Bogland Monster, they called it in these parts, the monkey ground and the thing's smell. A smell of rotten eggs is what has given it its name. The creature's been seen eating corpses of murder victims left in these Irish bogs, digging up long dead corpses and hanging them from trees and slaughtering campers and hikers. The monster has caused a panic, and now he must go. The creature's alleged appearance is that of a large humanoid spider, but the eyewitness accounts are rarely reliable. The human memory is very fickle, and those left alive to tell are usually decades apart. He slid around the corner and positioned himself beside the door, his breath so shallow, anybody standing next to him would think him dead. He stood there, waiting for a sound, anything to give away its location. Waiting and waiting, his eyes closed, body still and the only sound he made was his heartbeat. His meditative state opened up his surroundings. Every minuscule sound was amplified and pinpointed. A mouse running across the roof, roaches inside. He could hear them, and he knew where they were. A chitter. His eyes opened with a start. A sound unlike anything he'd ever heard before came from within the barn, and he knew what it was. His eyes opened and he turned to confront it. As he raised his leg to bust open the door, it exploded outward. Shrapnel tore into him, and the bulk of the door smashed into him as he went airborne. He began to lose consciousness immediately. The impact with the ground woke him up, and he began to roll rifle still in hand. The creature landed where the monster hunter lay a split second before. The roar of this beast was said to have been heard 12 miles away, and family dogs went berserk. The beast looked like a massive praying mantis and a human somehow procreated and birthed this monstrosity. White flesh stretched across long bones, jointed bulbously, and had a face not even a mother could love. A mixture between a dog and hornet, a mouth lipless and full of jagged teeth eager to shred the hunter to ribbons. The hunter only got a split-second look before the monster screeched. The hellish sound resembled the sound of bending metal the sound a ship makes when it rubs the dock or runs aground. The hunter covered his ears and fled. Ducking behind a haystack, he peered out and looked longingly at his rifle, currently being trampled by the creature's three-toed hind legs. The hunter quickly assessed the damage. The shrapnel tore into his hip and legs, but nothing too serious. After plucking out what he could, he quickly sprinted for the barn. The bog monster roared and started bounding after the hunter. The gait of its legs was 15 yards, 
It covered the distance to the door in no time. The hunter, seeing that he wasn't going to make it, drew his bowie and launched himself at the beast. The bog man, not expecting the hunter to suicide himself, was caught off guard. His long, slashing forelimbs had no time to come up and defend. The hunter's blade went hilt deep into the monster's upper chest. It slashed this way and that, only to cause the blade to shred. Whatever it has in there, the monster's screams deafened the hunter. The mantis-like face of this creature was trying to bite the hunter, its snapping beak-like mouth inches from the hunter's head. But he hung in for dear life as the bogman spun around and around, terrified and going berserk. The hunter knew now was the time to try and kill it. He wrapped his legs around the bog monster and started stabbing as blood and something else started gushing out, covering the hunter. The smell was out of piss, excrement, and ginger. The hunter tried to scream as he gagged the pus-blood mixture from his mouth. He stabbed with all he had, and the blade stopped, lodged in bone. He left it and used it to launch himself with his feet away from the monster. He landed and rolled to his feet. He was losing this fight, and now, unarmed, he had no chance. With no more time to ponder, he cut out and hurried towards the barn. He bounded up the haystacks and rolled into the loft, hoping to hide and catch his breath. But no sooner had he got to his feet, the beast burst through the wall with a screech that blurred the hunter's vision. He ran for cover, careful to miss the holes above the stalls. The monster began tearing the floor to the loft in search of the hunter. He knew he wasn't getting out, rolling back away from this nightmare. He stumbled over something and fell and landed with a solid pain in his backside. His salvation landed in his lap. It was as if he knew what to do with the pitchfork before he even registered what it was. He was on his feet, bounding towards the bogman with the fork held aloft, screaming like a warrior from hell. He leapt from the attic and drove the forks into the monster's face, stopping its destruction. The beast thrashed and screamed, but was unable to escape the hunter. He rode the creature to the ground and stepped out of the stinking mess, but not before wrenching his blade out of the bogman. He looked into the sun as it was coming up over the rolls. He took his chest strap off and carved a notch into the cowhide. Number 45, he sighed, and nursing his hip, he looked up again in awe of this Scottish morning. The morning bird's song was beautiful, carrying itself across the field with the morning fog. He marveled at the landscape and relished at how much this looked like the flatlands of his native Kentucky. He retraced his steps to his horse and cart after feeding the beast and thanking her for not running off after hearing the monster's call. On many occasions, he's had horses thrown him at the first scent of the undead. He pulled the cover off the content in the bed, revealing his pack and bedroll and portable point-to-point -point communication box. The wonders of the modern world never fails to impress the hunter. His first day on the job, he was whisked away underground to only emerge 3,000 miles away mere hours later. After cranking the device several dozen times, it came alive with a series of beeps, whines, and grinding. After he turned some knobs and aligned the antenna on the headset and placing it over his ears, he began to speak into the receiver. Hunter 1212, incoming stats, copy? He stood waiting for the reply that never took long. 1212, waiting, come back. He fiddled with the knobs to make sure he was on the right frequency. Confident he was, he brought the speaker to his mouth. Control, confirm your copy. After a beat, the box lit up, and on the faceplate, the number 001 flashed. 1212, this is Mama Dog. Copy loud and static free. Standing by for stats. The crisp voice of the young man the hunter met on only one other occasion came through the headset and this time, like every time, his voice was something he had a hard time believing he was actually hearing. This young man was sitting in a building under 12 feet of ice 200 miles north of Juneau, Alaska, and he could hear him as if they shared the same patch of Scottish grass. The creature labeled VD0976 is confirmed, eliminated. I need a cleaning crew and a team to explain its call. The sound was like that of grinding metal. The hunter pulled out a pair of glasses with the same antenna as the two on the headset and put them on. Copy that, 1212. The team is readying in Invernus 
It'll be there in approximately three hours. Please stand by. He adjusted the thick glasses and plugged the massive adapter into the comms box. It rattled and beeped. Ready when you are, Mama Dog. He depressed the large black button on the top of the box, and the glasses glowed a blinding light, and he was swept back to the moment he kept from the hayloft. The hunter slumped into the cart. His horse grunted at him. Perspiration dripping into his eyes made him wince. Images coming in, 1212, and they are magnificent. The hunter stood back up and removed the shades, his eyes now watering and his vision blurry. He hated the glasses. He never understood the importance. He'd been reprimanded for not getting the images sent in, even when he failed to capture or eliminate the target. This tech was borderline witchcraft. He could see how this type of thing could work with electricity, telegraph, and those sputtering vehicles. Technology is the real currency of this world. With the right amount of money, one could cook anything up. Got what you need? The hunter asked. These bifocals give me a headache. Another flash from the bifocals sent him zooming into a pulsating light, and through the light he could make out a shape writhing. After putting all his equipment up, he led the horse back to the barn making sure to avoid the monster. Horses and abominations don't mix. He began setting up his tent. These cleaning crews take their time. Home Wreckers by Reitman Ryerson The house was sinking. That's how Victoria's husband, Jose Luis Torres, explained it in Spanish to his wife. The company built their house and the surrounding places on soil it knew was too soft. Insurers would not pay for the damage. They said it was the builder's fault. The standoff slashed the value of the houses, so the neighborhood hired a legal firm and they were suing the home builder. Torres was the last name on the plaintiff list. The home invasion occurred at 2.15 a.m., three weeks after their lawyers filed papers at the courthouse. Neighbors reported hearing music so loud and menacing that they feared going outdoors. Those who did peek through their curtains found a darkened street and porch lights. At the Torres' front door, two intruders in masks and Kevlar used a ram to force their way into the Torres' home. One cleaned out the upstairs safe, while the other intruder shotgunned Jose Luis in bed but left Victoria alive and unhinged. Sentries in head and body armor grouped around the truck that blasted the gangster rap. By the time anyone called the police after they heard what might have been a gunshot, the music had stopped. The attack shattered Victoria. The police investigation pointed to her husband's involvement, but Victoria dismissed that. She blamed the home builder for her husband's death. To her broken way of thinking, the intruders had not been cartel mercenaries sent to recover and punish. They were assassins, paid by the builder to murder her husband and stop the lawsuit. Several nights a week, she relives the ordeal inside the house, her only connection to the United States. The scene begins the same way every time, and once it starts, its course is sure, like a stone sinking through water. Gangster rap resounds from the driveway, jolting the black-haired woman upright and stopping her breath in her throat. She stares with dread across the living room from the couch where she lies each night without sleeping, the sheet snug under her chin. The truck roars rhythms that send the house staggering backward like a palm tree bending in a dust storm. The couch under her trembles like a nervous cat, and the Arcadia door shivers in its track. Victoria's cry is a keening sound. Outside the window, the leggy bougainvillea sags against the porch alcove. The sky is at peace, the night humid and silent, the street empty except for the guard parked at her curb. The world beyond her windows does not share Victoria's horror. Iron-booted feet dash up the sidewalk, and the front door claps open before the window can gasp. The walls bow outward, the foundation bends, and the frame twists. The vaulted ceiling threatens to collapse and bury her. Victoria pulls up her shoulders and screams. The swollen-faced, wild-haired woman shrieks, but the maelstrom drowns the animal sound. 
A torrent of epithets, shocking and wicked, pierce the cyclone that opens and puckers every corner of her house. Then footsteps hammer up the bare wooden stairs. A gunshot explodes inside the master bedroom, which Victoria has not entered since that night. Boots thunder down the stairs and then out the door. The air inside chases the pounding sound. Oxygen gushes from the collapsing house like air from a punctured lung, leaving the gas of gun smoke in its place. The walls suck inward, the door crashes shut against the jam, and its deadbolt shoots into the hole. Iron fingers grip Victoria's chest and squeeze the last air from her. She cannot inhale, her mouth gapes, but her closed throat provides nothing, not a molecule of life. She gags on her tongue and lurches toward the front door, but her thighs and knees crumple without warning, and she flops to the floor. She drags herself across the carpet, eyes bulging and mouth working, crawling on elbows through wet sand. Her heart pounds in her ears. At the front door, she lunges at the handle and pulls herself up. She fumbles at the deadbolt with numb fingers. She throws the door against the stop and dives through it just before it rebounds against her ribs. On the porch, the cement sidewalk dissolves into black water, and the window falls face forward into it. The builder, Victoria reasons, having killed her husband, is trying to scare her out of the house. However, she is promised to the memory of the murdered man to spoil the home builder's scheme for as long as the house stands or until they confess their plot in front of her neighbors. But there are no neighbors. They have fled. No one hears her screams. There are no cars on the street except for the security car that parks at the curb in the early hours of the morning and the phantom gangsta truck that glides past it, unwitnessed. The security guard has witnessed, though, each of Victoria's dives to the concrete porch that has swollen and scarred the widow's face. Her story about the builder wanting to scare her away is the same every time, and she tells it the same way every time, as if she's telling it for the first time. She repeats it while she presses tattered fingernails together in front of her face to hide the cracked lips and broken nose below her swollen forehead. Even when the guard points out that there isn't a bit of wood or stucco missing from the house, she holds fast to the only argument she can follow. The security guard admits that the house tilts backward, but that, he knows, is caused by the soft soil, the reason the subdivision is as vacant as Chernobyl. In the last week of September, the house itself puts an end to the matter. Stressed by unseen agents, the house folds inward. It leans ever more away from the street until the roof beam splits. The rear of the two-story dwelling caves toward the center while the roof sags like wet cardboard. It is then that the guard feels he has cause to act. He calls the city inspector, who condemns the house. The house is unsafe, the building inspector tells the widow through a Spanish-language interpreter. He hands her the order, you'll have to leave for your own safety. The company will be forced to demolish it. The widow exults. I have been right all the time, she spits into the face of the inspector. Her eyes are feral, black and scorching. The builder has wanted to tear down my house. At last, they have admitted it. The widow's retort bewilders the city inspector, but he keeps his face bland. Victoria leaves. Now that the truth has been told, she can go. She departs the United States in her black sedan with savage hair blowing free and drives south to the Sea of Cortez. She can picture her home's rocky bay, smell the green, salty sea, and hear the cries of the black-winged gulls that float like kites in the wind. The wailing ceases, but the sodden house lingers. One morning, it shudders. The front half drops to the ground, followed by the rear, which pitches on top. It is a ragged heap of debris and a shower of dust in 15 seconds. There isn't much left for the company to do. A tractor scoops up the remains of the property and pours them into a dump truck. By the end of the day, the demolition crew has tidied the foundation. At dusk, the cement slab lays in the long, narrow lot of the murdered man, as clean as a grave marker.
One final story for our Thriller Thursday is coming up when Weird Darkness returns. Strange creatures, gruesome murders, oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book One is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, suspense, possession, and more. Dark Intrigues Book One by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book One on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Stone Hollow by Jared Smelker The three rules to live by are simple in Stone Hollow. Be courteous to your neighbors, keep your house and yard looking good, and don't go outside after dark on Halloween. Ever. Most follow these simple rules. Some don't. And that's a shame. Jeff Connor had just moved into the Stone Hollow subdivision on October 4th. The two-bedroom house on 761 Maple Street was a quaint, pale yellow house with green shutters and a brick fireplace. The yard was adorned with maple and pine trees along with a few bird feeders and a bird bath. Fall had come early, and already the leaves had turned to brilliant oranges, yellows, and reds. Some of the leaves were on the ground, but most were still hanging tight to the trees. The weather had been pleasantly cool, and it seemed to rain every other day. Jeff was a single guy in his late twenties. He'd moved to Grand Blanc from Oregon for a better career opportunity. He wanted to live near the city, but not in it. Someplace quiet, with friendly neighbors and thoughts of one day raising a family. Even from day one, his neighbors waved to him and said hello whenever they passed. Stone Hollow was on the outskirts of town. It was a subdivision cut out of the thick woods back in the late 1950s. There was only one way in or out. The railroad had tracks that ran to the north of the area, and part of them ran directly through the subdivision. Most of the time it was quiet, but once a night, a freight train would come through. Residents were used to it. Some would even hum along to the whistle as it traveled through. Halloween was coming soon, and the residents were busy decorating for the holiday. Every house had some type of decoration. Some were scary, while others were comical. Pumpkins adorned every porch or patio, and fall wreaths hung from every door. It was always the tradition in Stone Hollow to decorate for Halloween. Jeff's direct neighbor, 90-year-old Mrs. Maxine Taylor, or Grammy Maxie as most called her, sauntered over to Jeff's early Saturday morning on the 21st with a full welcome basket. Just as she did every time a new person or family moved into the subdivision. She was sweet that way. She was sweet in every way, actually. Just a little bit of a woman with thin, long gray hair and a slight limp because of failing hips. Maxie was the official, unofficial welcome wagon to the newcomers of the area who always had a large basket full of goodies. Homemade cookies, coffee, coffee mugs, cinnamon rolls, crackers, candy, and the local newspaper. Hello, Mr. Connor. Are you getting ready for Halloween? She gently placed the basket at Jeff's feet. Jeff was putting out a few new Halloween decorations he purchased the day before. Yeah, I think I'll buy a bags of candy to hand out. He stuck a small scarecrow into the ground. What's this? Jeff picked up the basket and began to rummage through the contents. Oh, just a little welcome to the neighborhood package for you, Mr. Connor. 
she gleefully smiled and held open her arms for a thank you hug. He hesitantly thanked her and gave her a light hug. He figured if he hugged her any tighter, she'd break. He had to bend down quite a bit because she was quite short. He noticed she smelled like a combination of sugar cookies and baby powder. It reminded him of his own grandmother. Her cheerful tone turned slightly serious as she placed her hand on his arm and looked directly into his eyes. You know of the three rules here, Mr. Connor. Yes, my realtor read them off to me when I bought the place. They seemed pretty reasonable, but that last one? I'm not so sure about. What exactly does that mean? Well, Mr. Connor, that last rule is quite an important one, I assure you. I'll get my grandson George to stop over and tell you about it. He only lives two houses down. She turned away, smiling, and walked toward her house. You can call me Jeff, you know, he shouted. She just waved at him and disappeared inside. Jeff shook his head in a state of confusion, adjusted his ball cap, and then went back to placing his Halloween decorations. He didn't necessarily decorate for himself, as it was more for entertaining the neighborhood kids. Jeff was never really into Halloween, even as a kid. Sure, he participated in trick-or-treating with his schoolmates, but a half-filled sack of candy was good enough for him. He usually retreated home early when his friends would stay out later and hit every house they could some more than once. Later that afternoon, Jeff was finishing up the decorations and setting a few pumpkins on his front porch. "'Hello, neighbor!' he heard from behind him. It was George. "'I'm George Taylor!' He reached out to shake Jeff's hand. The two men shook hands and introduced themselves. "'Heard Grammy Maxie paid you a visit this morning.' George adjusted his hat. "'Yes, indeed she did. She gave me a very nice welcome basket, too.' George smiled. Yeah, she's a sweet one. God bless her. The two enjoyed small talk and got to know each other. George even helped Jeff hang orange lights on his porch. George was a tall man, about six foot four, with strong, squared shoulders and squared jaw. Clean shaven, even his head, except for a larger than life red haired mustache that covered most of his lips and face. His voice was deep but pleasant. George was a good man, a hard working family man with a wife and five kids. Did Grimmy Maxie tell you about the three rules? George folded up Jeff's ladder to put it away. She did, but said you would explain the third rule to me. I didn't quite understand what it meant. Jeff wiped his hands off with a rag and reached for two beers from the garage refrigerator. He opened them and handed one to George. It's simple, really, George began to explain as he took a sip. Halloween is fun and exciting for the people of Stone Hollow, especially the kids. We come together as a community and enjoy the day as friends and neighbors do, but when the sun begins to set, we depart the streets and yards and head for home. Wait, isn't trick-or-treating usually at night? Jeff took a swig of his beer. Normally for most communities, but not ours. George's firm tone continued. Everyone knows that in Stone Hollow, you celebrate Halloween and trick-or-treating in the light of day. At night, Everyone goes inside, locking all of the doors and windows. No one comes out until morning. Ever. That's how it works here, Jeff. Uh, okay. Jeff's body language and tone were slightly of a mocking manner, essentially brushing off the seriousness of George's message. And why is that? George stood straight, moved in a little closer to Jeff, and looked directly into his eyes. Do you really want the truth, Jeff? Yeah, sure, Jeff said playfully. He really did not understand the serious nature of Rule 3 and, in his mind, already brushed it off. George began to enlighten Jeff after taking a seat on the front porch steps. His knees creaked as he sat and removed his old worn straw hat. George took a deep breath as Jeff sat beside him, both men taking a long drink of their beers. George began. When Grand Blanc was settled in the spring of 1822, the settlers were told by the local Indian tribes to never venture into the deep woods, especially at night. They described horrible things that would take place to their people from something they only referred to as the creature. They described it as 
something that could change in size from a foot tall to ten feet tall. It was like a part wolf, bear, and ape with thick hair, a dense, heavy tail, long muscular arms, and razor claws. They said it had empty black eyes with a massive mouth filled with hundreds of large teeth. George stopped, took a long swig of his beer, and groaned. He continued, when anyone entered the deep woods, they would never return, except for one young Indian boy who went into the woods with his father, only to reappear hours later covered in blood. His father's blood. The young boy described the creature and spoke of the ear-piercing howl it made as it tore his father apart. The Indian medicine man and chiefs placed a curse on the woods to hold the creature at bay. For many years, no one ever ventured into the deep woods at night. So Stone Hollow's now in the middle of these deep woods? Jeff clutched his near-empty beer bottle. You are correct, Jeff. We are smack dab in the middle of what were the deep woods. Now we're a subdivision with homes, driveways, and flower gardens. In the 50s, when the subdivision was built, no one really knew about the creature, or they chose to forget. Can't block progress, you know. Well, well so it's only on Halloween night that something happens now? Jeff asked as his body began to get restless. People believe today that when the medicine man and chiefs placed a curse on the land, and the creature, the curse, held it, except for one night a year, Halloween. George took a final swig of beer, emptying the bottle. Come on, George, this is the new millennium. Do you really expect me to believe some crazy story like this, especially so close to Halloween? Jeff stood up, retrieving his bottle of beer, and shook his head. Good one, George. I'm sure all the newcomers to the subdivision hear this same story. George stood up and handed Jeff his empty beer bottle. Lots of people have lived here for years with no issues, Jeff some for generations because they followed the three simple rules. Those who don't follow the rules usually aren't around very long. The guy who owned your house before you, he wasn't around very long." George shook Jeff's hand and grinned. Well, George, I appreciate the words of wisdom and the fair warning, but I think I'll be okay. I don't plan on going anywhere, and I certainly don't believe your urban legend either. Jeff smirked assuredly. Suit yourself, young man. Suit yourself. Happy Halloween. George waved goodbye as he walked down the driveway towards his own house. Halloween morning came to Stone Hollow, and already the kids were in costume walking the streets. Parents were handing out candy along with cider and donuts to all the neighborhood kids. Neighbors were talking and passing dessert and casserole dishes to one another. It was a crisp, cool fall morning with just a hint of sunshine pouring through spaces in the thick gray clouds. Jeff was up drinking his coffee and handing out candy to anyone who stopped by, and that was every kid in the neighborhood. He enjoyed watching them laugh, dance around, and show off their costumes. A few of his neighbors stopped by to introduce themselves if they hadn't already and offered homemade treats. Twice, Jeff asked sarcastically if anyone had seen the creature. Once asked, the neighbor's demeanor went from happy to irritation and avoidance. Jeff thought this was strange, and even though he didn't believe in it, thought it best not to mention it again. It was not his intention to alienate himself after only living in the subdivision for a month. The day was wrapping up with children all full of sugar, candy, cookies, donuts with cider, and pop to wash it all down. Most of the neighborhood was back to their homes, talking and laughing. Rain clouds now blocked the slight sunshine and a light mist started. The breeze was feeling a bit on the chilly side, and colorful leaves were sailing to the ground. Jeff grabbed a sweatshirt and a book, and then settled onto his porch to relax before having dinner. As night enveloped the subdivision, Jeff sat on his porch, eating the slow cooker chicken and dumplings a neighbor had dropped off for him. He noticed the neighborhood had gone quiet, except for the securing of doors and windows all around him. Within minutes, there was complete silence. No birds. No animals. No people. No nothing. Even the breeze quelled 
and the leaves stopped moving. Only silence. Jeff swallowed his last bite of dinner hard. This is ridiculous, he said to himself out loud. You people are nuts. Jeff set his bowl and spoon down and walked off his porch into his yard. His neighbor's doors were closed, windows shut, and blinds drawn. No lights were on except for a few street lights glowing here and there. Yep, happy Halloween, everyone, Jeff yelled out. He began to walk the neighborhood as if he hadn't a care in the world. He walked by Grandma Maxie's house and looked toward the house. She was standing in the front window, candles lit behind her. She looked out at Jeff, placed her finger in front of her lips and whispered, "'Shh!' shaking her head from side to side. Jeff, being arrogant and unafraid, took no heed of her cautionary message and shouted, "'Happy Halloween!' as he smiled, waved, and strolled by. Soon he was a block or so away from his house, close to the railroad tracks. There were no street lights near the tracks, only a thick tree line and large bushes. Jeff's non-belief and pride had the best of him. He didn't believe George's story, and he showed no fear walking through the subdivision. The sky was as black as he'd ever seen, except for a few stars and hazy moonlight. Jeff felt a distant breeze and could faintly hear the leaves being tossed around the ground. The hair on his arms began to rise. His mind began to wander and wonder. His self-assured attitude changed to meek in a matter of seconds. His stomach tightened. He could feel someone watching him. He could sense there was something in the bushes in front of him. He realized he was no longer alone. Panic filled his mind and body. His stomach turned and he began to sweat. He kept trying to rationalize the sounds coming from the bushes and the feeling of being watched. There's no way what George talked about is true, he repeated in his mind. For a second, he thought perhaps George took the attempt to scare him to another level. It's probably just George in the bushes, he thought. Jeff could hear the nightly train coming. He could see the train's light in the far distance and he could hear the clacking on the tracks. Time to go, he said under his breath. But he didn't move. The bushes no longer generated the commotion he heard moments ago. He could only hear the train now rushing by. Although the train was next to him and booming, his ears began to deafen. He could only hear his heartbeat. It was beating faster and faster. He felt every hair across his body stand firm. He could feel something directly behind him. He felt solid, heavy footsteps in the grass approached and stopped just behind him. He looked down at the ground in front of him. The faint moonlight cast a shadow of himself and then a much larger shadow overpowering his own. The sounds of the train were virtually non-existent. Instead, he could hear teeth clenching and grinding just behind him. His stomach dropped and sweat covered his face. His heart beat hard in his chest and he felt like he was choking. The train was there, right there, only a few feet away. He could jump for it, grab the train, and escape, he thought. The train speeding by made his hair blow in his face, yet the clamor was absent. He wanted to run. His mind raced, but his legs were numb and his spine frozen. He could smell blood waft from the creature's breath. He could feel the heat from its mouth next to his ear. His body began to tremble, and his palms were ice cold. Run, damn it, run, he kept saying to himself. But he knew, he knew it wouldn't do any good. The train passed him and quickly disappeared into the distance. Its whistle faded like the hope of escape. A raspy, guttural growl as if it came from the depths of hell now pierced the air. Jeff's body quivered and almost collapsed. He could sense the creature growing in size behind him. Jeff's body tightened as tears began to make their way down his sweaty face. Claws tapped his shoulder and then dug in. Pain began to envelop his upper body and he could feel blood start to make its way down his torso. As he turned his head and body to face the creature, the scent of sugar cookies penetrated his nose. He started to scream, but then he heard a soft, familiar voice. Shh. He looked up and stared directly into the creature's hollow eyes. What the? Grammy Maxi? Today there's a for sale sign in the front yard of 761 Maple Street 
if anyone's looking for a nice place to live in Stone Hollow. Only three simple rules to live by. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. Stories on Thriller Thursday episodes are works of fiction. My Friend Jeremy was written by Randy Hogan. The Day Ma Died was written by Luther Cross. The Basement Door was by Janine Franks. The Bog Body Boogeyman was written by H.J. Taylor. Home Wreckers was written by Reitman Ryerson. And Stone Hollow is by Jared S. Smelker from the book Wicked Harvest, Michigan Monsters and Macabre, which I've placed a link to in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And a final thought from Vic Johnson. Having a specific meaning and purpose in your life helps to encourage you towards living a fulfilling and inspired life. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness. <laughs>